How's everybody doing today? I just want to say, well, first of all, if, if we've never met before, my name is Eric Gray. I'm one of the deacons here. It's a privilege and a, an honor to be able to share a word with you guys today, but I just want to let you know that it, it does something for the leadership here when we can look out into a crowd and we see the numbers increasing, when we see uh, a faithful attendance and pe people just showing up and filling up these seats, and it, it means something to us. So... Uh, I've got 36 minutes to give you a 40-minute sermon, so let's, let's get right into prayer. Uh, Lord, I pray that you, would, that you would bless me, that you would use me, that this would be uh, something, that, something to be gained by everybody in here today, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would tune us in to the frequency you need us to hear today, and that it would just uh, restore our relationship to, to the next level, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as Tony, Pastor Tony said, we are kicking off a new series this week, and it's a five-week series. It's called Completely Committed. We're talking about maturity, discipleship, um, not just salvation, but, but a maturity in that relationship with God, and the cost and functional side of consecration, right? This is a, is a process. We know it doesn't happen overnight. So week two is going to be adversity and the completely committed follower. Week three will be practices of a growing disciple. Week four will be pitfalls of the follower. And week five will be committing to the call. Uh, the, the Bible verse we're using for this central uh, theme for this month is Proverbs 20, 25, which tells us it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider one's vows. All right, and so what we're going to be addressing here is... We, we've got this relationship with God that he's allowed us to have. He's, he's granted us the opportunity. And it's a, it's a huge responsibility. It's not something small. We didn't, we didn't join some pinochle club. We didn't join the Girl Scouts. And we didn't uh, commit to some single piece of ministry, right? We have entered into the new and everlasting covenant, as we just talked about a few minutes ago, as a reminder, with new and everlasting covenant with the creator of the universe. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, it's likely that we overlook that or we oversimplify that. And the gravity of that situation, I just want us to kind of soak that in today and, and remember that as we go through this. But it's important that because we have this relationship that we understand what's expected of us, what what should we be ready to encounter in this world and with God? And so this week, we're going to discuss common attributes. Now, obviously, we can't go over all the attributes a disciple should have um, in 35 minutes. It's just not going to happen. So please forgive me if I've, if I've not included something that you think is important. Obviously, there are many things that are important for a disciple to be able to do, think, say, and, and practice, all right? But this is, these are building blocks. This is square one. This is, this is the setup for the, the weeks to come. And so first off, we need to talk about what a disciple is. So most of us would consider di disciple to be a, a, referring to a person who is following Christ, all right? Christ follower. Uh, but in the ancient biblical world actively imitated both the life and the teaching of the master, right? This is a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master, right? This is something that takes purpose and intent and desire. And sometimes, let's be honest, we just don't have it. And if you don't, I spent years without the desire. I, I had the knowledge, I had the basic understanding, but without the desire, we, we don't really go anywhere. And sometimes we just need to surrender that. We just need to say, God, can you give it to me? And um, if that's where you are, that's okay. Right? We're all on a different walk at a different pace, at it, and we're going to get there at different times. Uh, but the whole point is we're all walking. We're not standing still. We're, we are on a journey to increase our connection to God, and we, we want to live that out as we should. So a, a thing about these attributes is they should be witnessable. They should be something. It's a living testimony to your connection with God, to your, your discipleship. Your following of him, it should be observable to others outside you. And we may have a habit of thinking, okay, we're about to list off some qualities of a person that's a follower of Christ, and we may start thinking of somebody who really needs that quality in their life, who's, who's really not demonstrating that. Let's not worry about that person. Let's worry about ourselves today. Let's put our blinders on and, and 
See if, if we are reflecting and demonstrating these things ourselves. It's, a, it's an opportunity for growth and uh, ref- self-reflection. All right, so the first thing is attitude. Obviously, we need to have the right attitude as a disciple. It's going to affect everything else we do. And the first thing is reverent. So Proverbs 15, uh, 16, 6 tells us, By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. So a disciple has a, has a reverence for the Savior. And we, we use this, this church lingo and language all the time. It's um, become second nature to us, right? And sometimes we just don't even give it thought. And my encouragement to you, my, my uplifting remarks to you is, now this is not a criticism of everyone, anyone. We want to maintain that reverence. Whatever that takes for you to maintain that reverence, this is God. This is the creator of all things. And he wants a relationship with us. It's not my buddy JC, you know. This is Jesus Christ. This is the savior of mankind lay down his life for us, and we need to have reverence for what it took for a, a God to be humble enough to put on human flesh, live that life, and then die for us when he hadn't committed a sin himself. That, that reflection allows us to have that reverence. That reverence is going to allow us to maintain the right mentality as we move, move forward as uh, disciples. So we need to be repentant. We know that, so when we receive salvation, this is this momentary occurrence that happens, right? Jesus died on the cross. We believe it. We confess it. He is our Lord and Savior. We are saved, right? But there is a sanctification that occurs. This is a process. This is a walk. There is a cleansing and a refining that happens for disciples and believers, right? And so we need to be maintaining a mindset of repentance, I've spent uh, the last five or six years just really having a whole bunch of things laid on my heart. It gets revealed to me with, you know, just an image of a moment in my life, whether it was I was in my single digits, my teens, my 20s, of things that I did that were sin, and I didn't acknowledge them then. I didn't acknowledge them as something I needed to ask for forgiveness when I really decided to start following Christ, right? And every time my sin is revealed to me, every time your sin is revealed to you, it's an opportunity to reflect and repent on just how sinful we were, just how much we needed him, just how far we are from him, and that we couldn't possibly reach him. He had to come to us. And it's it's that repentance that is going to assist us as well. In Acts 3.19, it tells us, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So the disciple has a repentant heart. We need, to, we need to maintain this. We need to strive to maintain it. And it takes deliberate effort, as discussed in the earlier slide. Right? This, is, this is something we need to pursue. Uh, we can easily lose sight of the greatness that has occurred on the cross for us. And, and we start to take it for granted and just, just live our lives. And I'm just asking you guys, I'm encouraging you, remain in this repentant heart. We need to be receptive to shaping. So Ezekiel 36, 26 is the Old Testament um, prophecy from God that says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we see the New Testament declaration of what has occurred because of the cross. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. This change that occurs in us is not, we can pursue it all day long, we can want it all day long. It's only occurring because Jesus Christ died on the cross, sent us his spirit, and that spirit resides in us and is activating things, changing things, right? But we have the option to kind of rebel against that and hold off, like, hey, I'm just not ready for that, Lord. And we have the option to to embrace it and be ready for that shaping and we got to know that that doesn't always, it's not always easy, right? Um, so as, as Christians, uh, we, a lot of times we'll use the term reborn or the phrase born again Christian. And, but at the same time, we'll use this phrase like, oh, he saved me or he rescued me. There, there was no saving in the sense like, oh, I almost died. We were not bleeding out. We were not suffocating. We were not drowning we were dead. There was nothing we were going to do to get out of that. 
we were dead, and he went and he got us anyway. We are in a new life, we're a new creation, and if we keep trying to live in that old life and hold on to those old things about ourselves, and it, it's just not gonna work. It's not compatible. There's no growth there. So a disciple is thankful for the shaping and the testing. And um, I shared this story earlier this morning, so quick thing, we, uh, as we got set in as deacons about two years ago, myself and Keith, we went through this whole thing, we come up here, right? Uh, before that, there's a conversation that occurs where there's these expectations laid out for church leadership. Hey, we want to make sure we're all on the same page. We are, we're joining in our own little covenant back there to, to, you know, to live life according to the same standards. And some of those standards are we don't watch adult content. Thankfully, not a problem for me. We are not profane. Used to be a huge problem for me. And we don't consume alcohol just for the purpose of we don't want to cause anyone else to stumble, not because it's going to send us to hell, Okay. Um, but we, we set those standards out and we agreed to them. Well, right after the, the ceremony of setting us in that day, I got to go to RDU, get on a plane for a, my grandma's funeral the next morning. And my, uh, my uncle, he was, he was generous enough to use his sky miles to get me a, a free plane ticket. And, uh, funny enough, the plane ticket came with two free drinks. And the young lady sitting right next to me is watching Naked and Afraid on her iPad the whole plane ride. So I'm literally like sitting like this, like, you know. Thankfully, you know, it's a test. It's not temptation, right? Thankfully, it wasn't something that I was really vulnerable to. And for me, it was just a laughable moment. Like, okay, here it goes. Like, what else is going to come, right? Um, so there's going to be those little tests, right? There's going to be big tests. And the ones we're really going to remember is the one we fail. And just because we failed in that moment doesn't mean it doesn't have some edifying purpose to us, that it won't convict us later on, right? That we won't, that we won't grow because of those failures. So don't, don't condemn yourself because you've gone through a test and you failed or you felt like you failed, right? God is doing something with you. But we know that as, so is iron sharpens iron, so iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We're going to be ready for that shaping through those horizontal relationships, right? We need to be ready for that, that blacksmith, him, to put us in the fire, to put us in the forge, warm up that steel, and get it ready for some shaping, all right? Maybe even getting hit a couple times between an anvil and a hammer, because shaping's not easy, and you, sometimes you have to be put in a situation. Many times you're going to be put in a situation to grow, and you, we need to be ready for that. We need to encourage that, um, and if we're, if we're asking for his strength through all of that, then it's really not going to be that bad, and it's going to reveal what really is important in that moment. Humble, or humility. We see Romans 12, 16 tells us to live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Then also in Matthew 23, 11, 12, the greatest among you will be your servant. This is Jesus telling us this. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So humility is so important because we're going to talk about servanthood in a few minutes here. And without humility, we're going to fail at servanthood. It's going to set us up with the right attitude to serve properly according to his ways. All right? It is not... The, one of the easiest ways to mess a, a, a Christian up uh, is to start giving them credit for the things going on in their life, right? And for them to receive it and not then give it right back to God, all right? So if you are, I mean, if you got a servant's heart, that just happens to be me, servant's heart, right? Um, I, didn't, I didn't give myself that heart. God gave me that heart. And if you've got, you don't know if, you've got your own spiritual gifts and whatever those are, whether it's servanthood or something else, God gave you the heart to do that. He gave you the, t the talent, the time, and the resources to do what it is you're going to do for people in his kingdom. And he gets the credit. You didn't achieve that. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and start believing it was you, and you'll lose it one day, right? Start believing in yourself instead of him. Start giving yourself the credit, and you will be humbled if you do not attempt to be humble, right? Um, but I want to be clear. Humility is not acting sheepishly. It's not a behavior as much as it's a mindset. It's not low self-esteem. We can be totally confident in who we are as children of God and still be humble, right? We can be humble servants 
But we have to maintain this understanding of who God is. What is my relationship with him? And then that dictates my relationship with everybody else, right? If I can maintain that humility, I'm going to do all right. So actions, now that we've got attitude taken care of, now we can go out and do actions, right? So this is what disciples' actions should look like. First is to love, and it's not, you, you might think, well, wait a second, that's an attitude. Nope, love is an action, and we're commanded to go and do it, and you can't be commanded to go and feel a certain way. You're commanded to go and do certain things. So John 3, 13, 34 tells us, Jesus again saying, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this love is first proactive and definitely witnessable. And it, why that's important is everybody in here is married. Well, not everybody, but everybody who's, who's been through a marriage understands I love my spouse. But if that love does not manifest in a visible, observable way for the other person, what good was it? And we fail, I fail at this plenty of times. I'm sure my wife is watching right now. And she's going to hold me to it later. We fail at this. We fail to demonstrate the love we feel. All right, there's a difference between the affection and what is represented. And this, this is probably one of our biggest failures as human beings. We, we end up harming the ones we love so much because we don't know how to demonstrate it properly and we're acting in fleshly ways. So I want to encourage you, love properly. If you don't know what love is and what it should look like, it's in the New Testament. It outlines it really well. It's love is patient, love is kind, and all the rest, right? It's, it's easy. It dictates it for you. Um... And if, why it's at the top of the list is if we're, not, if we're not understanding our obligation to love, we're going to mess up the rest of the actions we do, which is why it's at the top of the list. So if you've been here more than 30 seconds, you've heard us say that it is, we're called to go and make disciples. I won't sit on this for too long, but we know this is an action. We know this is a commandment Jesus gives us in Matthew 28. A disciple is tasked with not only becoming a disciple, growing closer to Christ, but at the same time, duplicating ourselves. As Pastor Tony alluded to, you could cheat and you could just make your own copies at home with your spouse, right? Or you can go out and you can make more disciples too. Both, both are totally legitimate. Neither one's cheating. I'm just kidding, all right? Um, but some of us, you know, feel a need to go out and evangelize. Some of us have those relationships that are opportunities to reach somebody that we work with, um, that, we, that we've been friends with for 30 years, whatever it may be. Um, and and we, have to, we have to risk those relationships sometimes to attempt to make somebody a believer, to attempt to help somebody that is a believer become a disciple. And there is a, there's a difference. So to serve, I, like, I hinted on this with, with humility, right? We are called to go and serve. Obviously, we want to do it in love. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.19 tells us, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. And this is Paul's approach. He's explaining, look, I, I'm ready to serve anybody if it's going to win them for the kingdom. It doesn't matter who they are, what they've done. They could have just, you know, spit in my face. If, if me being willing to serve somebody is what's going to win them over, if me being willing to serve somebody is what's going to make me more like Christ, I need to be ready to do that. And we see Jesus, again, says in 23, uh, Matthew 23, 11, again, the greatest among you shall be your servant. So a disciple does not just serve, but is a servant, and there's a distinction, right? We, we had a meeting a few months ago, and, and Pastor Jeff uh, shared this piece of wisdom that there is... There's a difference between serving in a moment and being a servant, right? So somebody who is a waiter or waitress at, at a restaurant, they clock in and they clock out to serve people. A servant is all day, every day, all the time, everywhere, right? That's a, a servant's heart and mindset is different than somebody who's willing to serve in a moment, willing to, I'm going to step down from my position of authority over you and serve you for a second and then go back and exert my power over you after that. If I have a servant's heart, I could be just as an effective leader as somebody 
and probably more effective as somebody who's willing to just boss people around and serve them for a second. And at the same time, I'm displaying Christly principles in, in doing that. It may seem like, like semantics or wordplay, but I, I think it, there's a huge distinction there. So to forgive, we know we're called to forgive. Uh, Matthew 18, 22, uh, 21 through 22 tells us that Peter came to Jesus and said to him, how, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. This is not the algebraic formula for forgiveness. So once you've forgiven somebody 490 times, you don't have to do it anymore, right? You have achieved the checklist for Jesus and you're good. No, he, what he's doing is trying to disrupt Peter's line of thinking. He's trying to, look, I'm going to blow your mind right now. You forgive as many times as the Spirit will allow you to forgive, right? And then when do we forgive? What are we, what are we waiting on to forgive, right? So should we wait on the request for forgiveness before we forgive? And in Luke 23, 34, we're expected to be Christ-like, Right? Jesus is hanging on the cross, dying, being mocked. His clothes are being gambled for, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These guys aren't repenting. They're not asking for forgiveness. They're not sorry for what they're doing. They might regret it later on, but in this moment, before any of that has occurred, he's saying, forgive them. And why this is important is a couple reasons. So, you will go through life and you will sin against somebody and not even realize it. If you didn't ask for their forgiveness and they're waiting on you to ask, then they're messing up by not, not giving you that forgiveness, right? That they're withholding that. If somebody has sinned against you and you're waiting on them, then, then you're setting that same standard for yourself. You're saying, well, if this person doesn't ask for forgiveness, I'm not going to give it to them until they do. Well, what about sins you don't realize you did, and now Jesus is waiting on you to ask for forgiveness for those sins you don't even know occurred? Matthew 6.15 tells us, But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we can be transactional about it and say, man, I need to give forgiveness because I want forgiveness. Or we can be responsive to Christ and say, I'm going to give forgiveness because I received forgiveness. Right? And so without this promise of forgiveness, the sinner has no hope, not one of us. So we'll reimagine for a second the, the death of Jesus and resurrection. So instead of dying on a cross publicly, he was knifed in an alley and died in the dark and nobody saw it happen. Resurrected three days later and just goes straight to heaven. Doesn't tell anyone. Doesn't tell anyone to go tell everyone else. Where's Christianity? Where's forgiveness? We would be operating in this world with no hope that we could be forgiven because nobody's telling us. You have a responsibility as somebody who's been forgiven and who wants forgiveness to go and share it and let them know they're forgiven. Now, I'm not saying go around and wave it over somebody's head like, hey, I forgave you about all these things you did, right? But in a moment when it occurs and it's, re like it's relevant to the conversation for that person and they're, they're letting you know, like, man, I feel bad about this, you got to let them know they're forgiven. Or they're going to be carrying that brick, those bricks, that load forever, thinking, man, this, I've, I've offended this person and they won't forgive me. We need to openly give that. We need to freely give it as freely as it was given to us. Agenda, I'm going to kind of breeze through this part a little bit here. Uh, so the disciples' agenda is first to seek the Lord, right? Psalm 119.2 tells us, Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Obviously, we want, we want blessings from the Lord. We want to seek him with all our heart. There is nothing we're going to be able to do without seeking him first. And because we've sought him, we can know him. Knowing him is going to help us in that process of becoming like him. To connect with the Lord is the next step. So once, I, once I've sought him, I know or understand him, now I can attempt to connect to him. And this is so key because, again, we're not going to do anything without him and his power, his spirit. So John 15, 5, 
Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Don't get me wrong, obviously we can go achieve a lot of things, but we're not achieving the things for God that he wants us to achieve without his help, without him sending us and equipping us himself. And then lastly, to conform. So because we've connected and we know him, we understand what's expected, now we can conform and we have to conform. That's, that's part of the process, becoming a copy, right? So you can't be successful and join the army and rebel against all the rules. You can't be successful as an employee at McDonald's and not do what's expected of you. It doesn't matter where you're working, what you're doing, you're, you're serving somebody else in this world and you need to represent them well. We are constantly serving Jesus. We need to be representing him well. And we only do that by conforming to what it is he expects from us and has commanded us to do, right? There's no surprises here. There's no um, weird expectations. And so Romans 12, 1 through 2 tells us, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And obviously we talked about it, his will, his way, his time last month. We have to conform to those things or we're going to be unsuccessful. We're going to not fulfill what's expected for us in our lives. Lastly, we're going to talk about commitment. It's because I've got my attitude. I know my actions. I know, I know my agenda, how it should go out and be played out. What is my commitment? And the first thing is sold out. It's not a one foot in, one foot out kind of thing. That doesn't work in marriage. It doesn't work in any other relationship, right? Jesus went all in. He didn't, he didn't have to do any of it. He could have changed his mind. He could have said, well, I'm only doing this for some of you. He's all in. He died so that all might be saved. Doesn't mean we all will, but he gave us the opportunity. So we need to be all in as disciples. We're going we're gonna to bear that name. We're going to bear that title. We're going to go out. We need to be sold out. And I could tell you, it just feels different when you go ahead and do it. When you say, I, I am submitted. I am willing to do whatever it is you need me to do, Lord. And you can be wrong, it's intimidating. Uh, it's, it's a scary thing to think of, like to give up control or the illusion of control in your life to serve him. But he's all in, so we need to be all in. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 tells us, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. And so... Um, about three and a half years ago, Pastor Tony said what was the most profound thing for me in all my time in church, but in 10 plus years here, and he, he kind of reworded it a few weeks ago, but it's this, the Redeemer wants everything he paid for. He didn't pay for a portion of your life or a portion of your time or a portion of your finances or a portion of your relationships. He bought everything. And it's not financed. It's not some five-year payoff plan. We're not on layaway. He bought us. We are his. We are not our own. And the sooner we realize and surrender to that, it just, it just makes life with him easier and at the same time more beautiful. So we know we need to deny ourselves. I can't serve two masters. I can't serve my flesh and his spirit. Right? Right? Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24 through 26, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So, Last couple slides here. To be bold and courageous. So we know 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 8 tells us, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 
So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, <clears throat> about our Lord or me of this pri- or or me his prisoner. Sorry. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick illustration here. Anybody seen Shawshank Redemption? Yeah, some of you are lying. I know it. All right. Um, so anyway, I'm going to use an illustration from that. I'm not going to talk about the main character at all. He doesn't really apply to this. But in the Shawshank Redemption, we see a story of, of two men. The name's Brooks Hatlin and Red Redding. Okay? Brooks is a gentle old man. He's been in prison 50 years. Um, and, and Red's been in, in prison for 40 years. Both men, guilty of sin. Both men found guilty and condemned for sin, for life. They had life sentences in prison. No hope of getting out. They go in front of the parole board, but they know the system. They're not getting out. There's no hope, right? But yet both men at different times are freed, released from prison, reborn into society without expecting or earning it. Brooks can't handle it. He has taken comfort in the prison walls. The movie refers to it as institutionalized. He is afraid to live this new life he's been given. He, he does not know what to do with it. In fact, before they let him out, he attempts, he threatens another man's life to, in hopes that they'll keep him there longer. There are people in this world who have been given this freedom and they don't know what to do with it and they reject it and it destroys them. So Red, he knows this. He's seen this happen with Brooks. He gets released, and he makes the attempt when he first gets out to follow all these same rules that he had in prison while he's free. He doesn't get it. There's a point there where he has to ask his boss to go to the bathroom because for 40 years he couldn't squeeze a drop without asking permission first. Quote in the movie. He finally makes a decision. He says, I'm going to live this life. I'm going to break the law. I'm going to make a parole violation and I'm going to run and I'm going to live this life. I've been given a new life and I'm going to go do something with it. I'm going to, I'm going to actually experience freedom versus claiming freedom and doing nothing with it. And so he makes that decision. You might say, oh, well, he's breaking the law. Well, we're not bound by the law. We're bound, we're, we're bound by covenant with our Savior Right? So the same things don't apply to us. Obviously, because we love God, we're going to uphold his commandments. Right? But we got a free life. We're on our second life. And we need to live it boldly and courageously. And so lastly, we have this responsibility and authority that comes with the knowledge and understanding of being saved. And so being a disciple is not about checking off some list. If you met all the criteria that went on these slides earlier... That's fine, but there's so much stuff that wasn't on those slides that is still unattainable for us. And just because it's unattainable doesn't mean we can't strive for it, doesn't mean we can't strive to please the Lord as living sacrifices. It's not a recipe for success. This, the Bible's not a formula for getting to heaven. We are our brother's keeper. We are responsible to go and share the word. We are responsible when we see a brother in Christ messing up or failing to call it to their attention, not to control them, but because they are our brother and we love them. Now, what they choose to do with it, that's on them. But we also move with an authority to go and speak the gospel. And this is, man, I, I apologize. I am not a dramatic person. So this is not going to come out as strong as it should. We bear the name of Christ we carry his message. We're not some mailman or FedEx man. We, we are carrying the message, the message of good hope for anyone and everyone in this world who will receive it. We are heralders of the second coming and there's a responsibility and authority that goes with that message. Some of y'all are gonna cast out demons and some of y'all are gonna speak in tongues and some of y'all are gonna heal people, but we're gonna do it all through Christ, for Christ, because of Christ. He gave us the authority to move in this world and do things for him, bearing his name. But we can't do that if we're not answering the call to that deeper relationship with him. And so I would encourage you, this, 
It is so easy in this life and in this country to be distracted, to be detoured from what it is we've been called to do, from our ultimate purpose, because we are not of this world, we just happen to be in it for a little while. If he's calling you, I'll answer it answer that call. Get closer. Take one step today. Take two steps tomorrow. Whatever it looks like. He's all in. He's all in for you. He's sold out. I'm just asking you to be sold out too. So let's go ahead. If you guys don't mind, stand with me. We'll pray. We'll get out of here. Lord, I pray that you would bless my brothers and sisters. Lord, that you would infuse in us your spirit, that you would ignite a flame that's been dormant for days or weeks or months, year, years for some of us. Lord, I pray that you would send us lit on fire to do your work and your will and your way and your time, Lord. Give us everything we need. Give us direction. Give us motivation. Give us strength. Let us carry that authority with humility, Lord. Let us, let us be courageous with humility, Lord. Let us do all because of you, for you, in you, through you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we'll see you guys Wednesday night for Going Deeper at seven o'clock. And if anyone needs prayer, we'll have prayer partners up here.